Okay, well, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for organizing. Thanks for your talk, Lorenzo. Um, and yeah, it's, oops, oh, something's happened with my screen. I'm going back. Okay. Uh, no, no, oh, there we go. Sorry, my, okay. Right, so yes, so uh, hello everybody. Um, actually, I was looking it up, uh, uh, Louise, before you go, and it's, it's actually next month, it'll be five years since we started this group. So maybe we should try and have a fifth, wow. fifth, fifth party, fifth dirt birthday party in the, for the next meeting. Yeah, so I'm up for that. Yeah. Uh, so we can have real pizza. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, is the sound okay? Fine for me. I don't Good. know if anyone okay. else has yeah. comments. Yeah. So anyway, so yeah, at that time, for those of you who don't know, I was actually working, in fact, I shared an office with Louise then, uh, when I was at University of Sussex, um, we were setting up Discus and I suggested we set up a meetup group and it's um, still going strong. And uh, so thanks to the support of the university and Peter before and now Louise and, and particularly the, the amazing support we get from Silicon Brian, who've uh, really kept us going and, uh, you know, do a fantastic organisation and hosting and so on. So we appreciate that. Um, so let's get on with the talk. Um, we obviously in the last two months we've seen an, an unprecedented interest in the uh, even in the public, I guess in in, in AI. So uh, I guess this this uh, talk is is topical. Um, so I'm, what I'm going to talk about here is uh, obviously open dialogue chat bo uh, chatbots because uh, chatbots, of course, have been around for a long time. So you might also call them generative AI chatbots, um, which is the term that's been used now and Lorenzo used earlier. Um, they've been around for a long time using you know, some of the methods, I guess, that Lorenzo talked about and rule-based methods. And it's it's only this um, revolution, if you like, with transformers that Lorenzo has explained is why we've got this uh, possibility to have um, chatbots, which are you know, open dialogue. So typically chatbots have been used in the past, uh, well, for probably for more than even decades uh, um, with some success in industry in vertical applications, but the, um, there's now, we've now reached a stage where it, uh, they can be used <clears throat> uh, in, you know, uh, for, you know, for a sort of a wide different, uh, number of different ways. So um, what I'm gonna particularly talk about is obviously because uh, I've been on search, I, I don't know uh, so much about um, um, uh, large language models, uh, although, uh, been involved in AI is more about search and so how it relates to search. Um, so I'll crack on with that. So, so obviously I'm, I'm CEO of Magique and I'll explain a bit more about Magique later on. We're basically a search engine. And if I go, go on to the next slide. So, so what the, I chose this title for the uh, for the talk because I, I it came to my mind that um, if those of us who are old enough uh, to remember it was that there's a very famous song called Video Kill the Radio Star. So that's where I got the idea for the title of this, of this talk. And um, so, and that was 19, that was written in 1979. Um, we got to number one in 16 countries. Um, so a little bit of history about that, um, um, which is kind of a bit, uh, for those of you who don't, who don't um, you know, much younger than me and uh, may not know it, but um, there's actually a very interesting um, um, Sort of motivation behind it behind the uh, song, which because uh, it actually was written by Trevor Horn, it relates to his concerns about sort of the um, uh, what was happening in in music, um, and it was really a very prophetic uh, pre, uh, piece. Uh, and as if to prove so, it was actually uh, this was before videos were used uh, really for, um, uh, for, uh, for pop songs and. It, and so it was. It was bemoaning the fact that the videos were taken over from from the sound, and uh, to, as if to be uh, prove his uh, prediction, it actually became the well. It was chosen as the first music video shown on MTV in 1981. Um, but the inspiration of the song uh, from Trevor Holm was actually because it, um, um, I, was really, I didn't know this actually until I did a bit of research for this talk. He was actually very much inspired by his reading of J.G. Ballard. Uh, and his vision of the future where record companies would have uh, computers in the basement and manufacture artists, as he put it. Um, and so, and J.G. Ballard has, actually has a, I, I don't know his uh, books very well, the stories very well, but he has, a, uh, he has one apparently called Vermilion Sands. It was um, 
kind of a post-apocalyptic uh, dystopia genre. Um, but he actually talks in there about, uh, quite amusingly, uh, with what's happened recently with a thing called Poetry Composing Computers. Um, and he also said he was inspired by Kraftwerk's uh, album uh, called The Man Machine, a very famous concept album, which starts, uh, begins with the first track where robots uh, are born in the first track and then experience the trappings of everyday life before evolving into the, in the last track into Man Machines by the album's close. So, so it's, um, it's quite interesting, um, you know, and we're now, um, you know, at a stage, I think, where, you know, we, uh, we could say the same thing, same thing about um, uh, chatbot, chatbots, perhaps, and I think these, the lines and lyrics put there on the uh, slide here are quite, uh, quite uh, resonant with today's world, I think. Anyway, enough of uh, the 19, uh, 1980s and so on. Um, the sort of topics I'm going to cover are uh, large language models and chatbots. Um, I'm going to talk in, in some detail, not in technical detail, about how ChatGPT works, uh, uh, which, and the main part of that is instruct GPT. I'm going to talk about alignment, um, AI alignment. I'm going to talk about search and answer engines. And I'm going to talk about um, uh, um, AI, AI and um, sort of some of the uh, techno politics, if you like. Um, so, okay. So, getting into it. So, large language models. Um, now, so I've done a table here of the kind of the sort of better known and bigger English language uh, large language models. Um, some of these are have some multi uh, language uh, data in them, but um, so I'm not going to go through all of these all in detail, but. We've got the names of them here. You you've might have heard of some of them, probably. Uh, well, you've heard of, you've probably heard of GPT, which is um, the um, sort of the one we'll explain later from OpenAI. Um, we've I've shown here the so the company they come from, uh, or the um, or the organisation they come from, uh, what access usage are we have. So Lorenzo was explaining um, this earlier, which so this is a good link up here where you see all the models from Google and DeepMind are. Uh, there's no access, and the access from Microsoft and OpenAI is, is just open uh, through API. Uh, but I put in here at the bottom here for open source um, uh, large language models, which some are, um, the ones from Meta are available for research purposes. Uh, um, and then there's a couple which are interesting because they're, they're actually purely open source community projects, which can apply to commercial usage. Um, and the, the column, the um, uh, here on parameters is is the number of parameters uh, in in the uh, in the model, and uh, things have changed a little. I guess Lorenzo will confirm like in the last twelve months or so, because there was a focus on a race to having more and more parameters to get a more powerful model. But but more recent developments show that that's not necessarily the case. So, for instance, uh, if you look at the um, uh, well, actually we can look at probably three examples here. So so Google of um, sorry, if you look at uh, the DeepMind one, we have Go for here. Which is 280 uh, billion parameters, but they're actually getting better performance, if I remember it correctly, from a newer model called Chinchilla, which is actually a smaller model. So it has it has more more parameters, but it does have uh, bigger data. So that their work showed that you could get more better accuracy by using more data and less parameters. And then Meta uh, just actually released on Friday, I think it was uh, their new language model, to which I guess is supersedes Opt. Uh, it's now called Llama, uh, and you'll see that's a much smaller um, uh, um, model in terms of parameters, but shows um, um, be better performance. So I won't go into the details of that, but they've compared, they've compared that with, um, with Opt and uh, GPT and so on. Um, you've then got Bloom, which is a, um, now I don't, Lorenzo may know this, but it's a kind of a community project run by an organization called Big Science, which I think is just a, I don't know if it's an organization, but it's basically done in collaboration with Hugging Face. So, Hugging, so you'll find that model on Hugging Face. And I think they were very heavily invo involved in that. Uh, Bloom is interesting because it's a, a, a multi language, uh, large language model. Um, it's developed by a, a huge community of people from across the world with expertise in all uh, various languages. So, that's very interesting in that respect. And then there's um, one called, uh, well, GPT, they have various models, but the, I think the, the most recent one is GPT-NeoX, 
from a community uh, open source project called Eleuther AI. Uh, where actually the leading guy in that is, is UK based, um, and that's um, been basically developed by a community of um, uh, researchers who meet on disc, um, you know, collaborate on Discord, and uh, that has a uh, twenty billion par parameters. Um, so that uh, gives you a flavour for the um, uh, these large numbers. Probably, um, you know, if I'd done this slide last week, I wouldn't have had a llama on there. And probably if I did it, um, we had a by the time it comes to our birthday uh, meetup in uh, April, we'll, we'll probably be more on there. So it's uh, evolving very rapidly. So what's in what data is in these large language models? So now the interesting thing which isn't mentioned too often is that um, um, you probably hear expressions in the press and so on and people talk about oh well it's everything from the internet well it, well it's not um and actually they use a variety of different sources and obviously each each one of these uh, language models uses different data sets however they all have one thing in common uh, or certainly one thing uh, big, uh, big thing in common which is the fact that they use um actually uh, data from um, what, what we regard as search indexes. So they all, for all those of those who actually declare, and the open source projects um, obviously declare what data they're using, whereas the, the more closed projects are, are, are you know, uh, somewhat opaque or more opaque, depending on who they are, uh, but they all have, um, those who declare it, all use um, a common crawl. Now, common crawl is a, basically a web crawl, uh, which is available as a data dump to anybody. Uh, it's a big file, obviously, um, and it consists of data from about 3 billion web pages. Um, and that's the main data source in all these large, large language models. Um, and and it, as you'll see later, it, well, as in fact, as it, it, I'm showing here, the actual in this table, this is the actual data for GPT-3. So GPT-3 uses uh, common crawl. Um, the, uh, if we take the, um, the Google model like Chinchilla or the um, uh, DeepMind, um, so, some of the other models, uh, we don't, they don't actually declare what they're using, they just refer, we're using web text. Um, so um, we don't know, but uh, I, I would lay a big bet that uh, Google and uh, Microsoft are using their uh, search indexes, uh, but they don't want to say so. Um, so, yeah, as you'll see there, it's uh, 410 billion tokens, uh, but the, 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 training, the weight in the training mix is 60%. Um, so, as the other language models also have mix in other uh, parts of data, and GPT-3 includes some web text, which is um, takes some text from uh, Reddit links, uh, from Reddit, um, outbound Reddit links from posted more than two, uh, two upvotes. Uh, there's two book corpora are used and Wikipedia. So, and you know, that's a fairly, you know, typical set, but each one is different, as I said. Um, so maybe on to the next slide. Okay, so search indexes are essentially at the core and the main part of large language models, which is uh, hence in, in particular our interest at Magic in, in this, um, because we, we are actually one of very few uh, search indexes in, in the world. So there are literally, there are probably over a hundred so-called search engines in the world now, but um, um, probably over half of them actually use Bing uh, in the background. Um, some, uh, there's a few of them use Google, um there's um but um there's actually uh, the this list this, this is literally uh i mean there might i might be missing one another one in china but the, these this is literally all of them so you have google and bing in the us obviously gigablast which is a one-man company in uh, a, in in the states with a, a pretty small index much smaller than common crawl actually uh, there's ourselves where the only uh, uh, international search engine in europe although there are there is a, um, a search engine in, in, uh, in the Czech, Czech and Slovakia called Seznam, uh, but they're just covering their local territory. Uh, and then you have Yandex in Russia. Uh, you have a new one called uh, Yap, which is a bit, uh, in Singapore. And then you have three in China, which is uh, Baidu, uh, Sogu and Petal, which Petal's from Huawei. So yeah, we, we're sort of we're a very small company. We're based uh, UK company. Most of us are in Sussex, although we're a fully remote company. We're 
we're a very small team trying to take on some real, real giants. Um, we've made some great strides, um, and, and we're actually you know, we're now we now have an index which is kind of is um, well, it's approaching seven billion pages, so it's actually more than double the size of Common Crawl. And we don't we don't know because nobody says, but the indications are that our index is, is approaching the size, if it's not already the size of, of the big index. So it's a very significant thing, and we we. We built that um, technology from the ground up, and we have our own. We built even big. We actually kind of build our own, assemble our own servers, and put them in a in data racks in a data center in Kent. And you can just see a picture there on the right of one of our um, one of our racks. So, but anyway, moving on to next uh, to generative AI chatbots. So, um, as Lorenzo was, uh, was explaining earlier. Um, um, Essentially, what um, large language models do is, and, and chatbots is, is they're kind of predicting the next word. So, what actually what I did earlier this morning, I went on the OpenAI playground that um, Lorenzo mentioned, uh, with the URL shown there, and actually I put in this string for a bit of fun. I said oh, I'm going to put in a string saying uh, because you know. Uh, AI chatbots are, as I, you know, many, um, I think there's a famous paper which uh, was written, which is written by, I think, uh, Meg Mitchell and um, uh, and others, which is called, uh, I can't remember the full title, but it involved, uh, uh, it refers to them being stochastic parrots. So I said, stochastic, uh, stochastic parrots predict the next, and then you have to predict the next word. So if we're all together in one room, which we're not, unfortunately, I'd probably be saying, right, okay, folks, put your hands up. And have a guess what the next word would be, but we're not, we're all remote, so I'll have to do that uh, for you. And uh, you can have a little guess yourselves. I guess we could do a poll, but we don't have the time for that. So um, it turns out you know, when I did it this morning, I got the the the, uh, the next word was word, funny enough. Um, so I then went on and I put some more words in, and I thought for a bit of fun, I'll put in saying stochastic parrots predict the next word making them useful for generating plausible. And I thought that'd be interesting to see what it said. Um, because, you know, you could take a view on this. And many people have said, well, they're for, uh, good for producing plausible bullshit. Uh, and certainly true in that. Um, obviously, it's used, for, used uh, for those of you who are coders will know it's been used for code. Um, data, perhaps, that's a possible one. Um, text, obviously, I guess. And uh, a lot of people are mentioning that the um, it being very uh, useful for, uh, for generating misinformation. So it'd be interesting to see what popped out there and what popped out was actually text. So that's, so that's how kind of a very uh, brilliant illustration of how it worked, but uh, you know, so you can actually do this yourself on the, on the playground um, that I showed on the previous slide. So I shall we'll go back to it now. We'll come back to it if you want to. Um, so moving on to the chatbots, uh, I thought I'd do a table of chatbots. So again, this this is changing uh, uh, very rap rapidly. Um, if I do this next week, there'll probably be another one on here. Um, uh, I thought I'd mention the ones, the main ones that are um, uh, that are kind of known about. So obviously, um, ChatGPT is the one that's got all the attention. Excuse the pun. Um, and is, um, but obviously, um, OpenAI. For those of you who don't know, I'm sure you probably all know, are working with Microsoft, who are, have their own uh, chatbot in in Bing, uh, in Bing, which is um, called Sydney. It was a, it was really, um, somebody had managed to um, jailbreak the uh, uh, the chatbot to, to discover it's called Sydney, and well, that wasn't intended. Um, and so uh, Google have announced uh, something called Bard, which you may have heard of in the press, uh, I think uh, two two three weeks ago. Um, um, there's also DeepMind are working on uh, something called Sparrow, um, and then um, Meta uh, actually released their chatbot in um, March last year, so well before ChatGPT. Uh, that's available freely, but only if you're in the US. Um, now, that's that's one actually that we were at Magic we knew uh, a lot about because actually they, uh, I can't say too much, but they approached us. We couldn't say anything until um, March last year, but they approached us in 2021, um, and they actually uh, used they used Magic to actually uh, you know, do a retrieval augmentation on, uh, um, uh, for the chatbot. So we've been um, they, they are using the Magic API together with with Blenderbot. So 
in terms of linking up chatbots with search engines and Meta and Majid together have been sort of a, we're ahead of the game and now others are actually looking at this. Uh, another interesting one is uh, character AI, which I'll refer to later, which is actually um, um, uh, a startup done by the uh, the main, uh, the, the guy who started the Lambda um, large language model at Google. And that's a very interesting one that's freely available. Um, now you can get up, go on and use that. Uh, there's Claude from Anthropic, which has just received, received, I think it was 300 million pound investment from Google, um, which is announced, uh, well, you can't use that yet, but it is available in, in uh, uh, an application called Poor, which is from Quora which actually I think allows you to run a sort of a smaller version of Claude inside it. I think it might be available through some other avenues, I'm not sure. And then uh, last but not least, um, so when, almost as soon as the chat GPT announcement came out, there's a, the, um, uh, a number of people got together and said, right, we better create an open source um, 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 chatbot, a bit like the Luther AI developed the uh, their open source large language model. And I think you know, some of the same people are involved. Um, and I know that, so that's the community and that's called uh, Open Assistant, um, which is, so that's open source and that's under development now. In fact, you could join that project. I can, I can show a link later for people who are interested. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, a bit of detail about how ChatGPT works. Um, uh, but not, I'm not, you know, I'm no longer technical, but um, so it's, this is kind of kind of high level, but uh, it'll give you, probably give you some insight. Um, so what, um, I think the way it, um, Lorenzo can answer the difficult questions and correct me if, if I'm wrong about these things. So, but, uh, so as I'm, I understand it, so basically in chat GPT, um, uh, they, chat, uh, GPT-3 is a, a language model. You can use it on the playground as, um, with the link I showed you earlier, you can have, maybe have a play with that if you're interested. And um, so the 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 idea of ChatGPT is is a, a train, basically a, a, a better trained version of GPT three, which is designed to be um, to be to be more aligned. So so as as we said earlier, large language models predict the next word, but they don't do it for any specific tasks. So you might say they're misaligned, um, and that's because of you know data distribution problems. Depends on obviously the all these models depend on the data that they're based on. And uh, there are all sorts of issues. Um, you know, one of the interesting things uh, that they, um, the open AI oops, um, researchers uh, particularly highlight is that, um, is that um, what prediction does is it doesn't distinguish between important and unimportant errors. So sometimes if you, you know, if, if, a, if a, um, a different word was chosen as, the, as a, in the next, for the next word, was well, technically the next token in in a, in a sequence. Then sometimes that will be really important to um, to what uh, the uh, the response you would full response you would get, and sometimes it wouldn't matter so much. So, so they wanted to uh, develop techniques to uh, to uh, to improve that, and so they've locked into various techniques, and which I'll briefly refer to later. But essentially, the this method RLHF has been much more successful and even to them, extra, uh, you know, surprisingly successful and explains, you know, why uh, ChatGPT is, is kind of, you know, uh, it's shown so much promise. So, um, so we talk, um, so as I said, the, essentially these uh, language models are misaligned. So OpenAI basically, um, you know, and, and all the, uh, these AI companies actually um, working on, um, well, we're talking about language models here, right? um, seek to align the uh, language models with, uh, well, clearly with, with human intentions is obviously what you uh, want to do, I guess you might want to do something uh, more, um, else, but uh, that, any responsible company would want to do that. And, and OpenAI specifically chose to optimize their um, large language model, uh, these models um, for three specific things. And obviously there, there are issues around how do you measure this, uh, but specifically they asked their wanted to address helpfulness to, so to make so it's essentially obviously chat GPT is very like an assistant so you want your assistant to be helpful so that's an obvious one you want it to be uh, they actually use I've, I've used honesty because because they ended with three H's they actually use the word truthful but I think that's uh, another way of putting it but obviously it's, it, how do you do measure truth <laughs> um, and then harm 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 so they mentioned harm or harmlessness so so you can think of it as three H's 
Um, and so what they then did, what they essentially did, uh, and I'll illustrate this in the next slide, is they actually basically got a lot of people uh, to give feedback based on the outputs for prompts uh, put into language model. So, um, so they actually, um, I don't know, I can't remember the numbers of people involved, but I know that they, you know, a big part of the people they, they, they hired to do this was uh, through, through um, uh, Upwork and Scale.ai and uh, a lot of them were, were essentially, you know, remote workers in, in Kenya being paid some $2 a month, an hour or something to, to, to do this. And they were asked to rank outputs to prompts. So they'd be given two to so a prompt uh, for a given prompt they'd be given uh, two two outputs and then say wh which one's better or or are they more or less the same. Um, <clears throat> so and then those um, and so that that's then used to train what's called a reward model, uh, which is um, essentially is, to, is is kind of the objective function for the tra training um, training stage. And, and so essentially, what that training model's tra objective function is trying to do is to mimic human preference and then what you uh, they do they do is they use then we use re reinforcement learning to uh, optimize by feeding it more prompts um, um, and optimize it using the, the reward model uh, uh, to improve the uh, the uh, performance and hence the term so rlhf which is reinforcement learning by human feedback so if that's um you know uh, that might be a bit clearer when if we try and look at their diagrams they're kind of famous diagram which comes from their paper which everybody's reproducing now all over the place um, this shows the, the the three steps that i've talked about so essentially that there's a first step here which actually we don't need to worry about because essentially this is a first step which is as they explain is not essential it's um it's a, it's a supervised training method which is just used to bootstrap it so we won't worry, worry about that the main the main the main part is this um um the human feedback part here is step two so where you collect, um, essentially where you put in, a, um, you have prompts uh, which are collected, and I'll talk about how they're collected later on. Um, and so they're fed, fed into the model. Um, the model then produces multiple prompts, so not two actually. Typically, they were, um, if I remember in the paper, they, they actually from the prompt they produce anywhere between four and nine prompts, and then and then they ask the uh, human scorers um, to actually rank those outputs. Um, actually pairwise, so you know, one against two, one against three, one against four, uh, to, uh, with all of them. So you end up with a ranking for the outputs, and then that data is used to train the reward model, okay? And so with that done, then the reward model is actually then used in uh, reinforcement learning to actually, um, to, to basically score, um, uh, to calculate a reward for the output from, uh, oops, from, um, uh, from, um, from further, further, further prompts, uh, and that, and that way you would you'd improve, um, improve the performance of the model. So that's uh, so that's sort of broadly how it, how it works, and uh, um, so we can ask questions about uh, that later. We we'll talk about that later if you if you want. Uh, just to give you to some insight into the performance. Um, sorry about the uh, um, this is a bit blurred because I, I took this from a from a presentation because there wasn't uh, the same graph in their paper. Um, so I've been explained a little bit about this. Um, so there's a few, quite a lot of things on here. So essentially, there's there's three model sizes here. So the main, the biggest um, uh, G GPT three model is, is 175 billion parameters, but there's versions with six billion, 1.3 billion parameters. So they tested it on all three the three model sizes, and then there this is this is showing the performance for uh, five different things. You can you can um, the you can essentially think of the the red and yellow ones as the instruct GPT model, so you're using reinforcement learning. Uh, the SFT is the is a supervised uh, uh, training one that they, they they did, so which they were comparing the other four against. And then there's a G, sort of raw GPT, and then there's GPT um, with in tried to, where they tried to improve it with prompting. So we don't need to worry about that. So um, so if you look in here, this is saying what you know what's basically what's the win rate against SFT? So you see, obviously, if we look at the SFT model with 175 billion parameters, um, you know, obviously the win rate is, is a half, right? Because it's, it's comparing with itself. And so the really, um, what's, what's um, shows the real performance here of, of the GPT. obviously lifts the, 
um, it lifts the performance of over a supervised tra uh, training methodology. But what's really interesting is that the performance of even the 1.3 billion uh, parameter model is higher than the, the uh, SFT model, uh, the supervised training model, uh, you know, with a with a you know a model size which is what a hundred hundredth of the size of the of the bigger model. So, so that's uh, gives you an insight into some of the performance. And you know, so, in, um, so here's some examples. I'm probably going to have to these. Are, I apologise. This is small. I'm probably going to have to read some of these out. Um, so I took what um, I actually put these in this morning in here into uh, here in in here into the playground. So this is running it on GPT three, and I said. Um, I said, explain gravity in less than 40 words. Uh, and, it, and I said, explain quantum electrodynamics to a seven year old in less than 40 seconds. You can see I like phys physics. Um, and so maybe I'll read out that one. It says, um, quantum electrodynamics is a theory that explains how electricity, light, and magnetism work in the tiny particles that make up everything in the universe. And when I put the same thing into chat GPT, uh, or instruct GPT uh, model that we just explained, um, it said quantum electrodynamics is a fancy way of saying how tiny particles called electrons and photons interact and make light. So you can see there how it's tried to be more, I suppose you could say more, more helpful. Um, um, you know, it's, it's responded to my prompt and, you know, and, and, and come up with, I guess, a more, you know, um, yeah, more helpful uh, response, which you know kind of explains why you know the um, I guess you know Chat GPT is is, is being more usable for the general audience than the GPT three. Um, and then now what I then did I did I I I'd sort of read I read on uh, Twitter a couple of a few days ago about this is a uh, the bottom left here is um, this is the uh, AI uh, the alignment leader the the leader of the alignment team at OpenAI who says, um, with the Instruct GPT paper, we found that our models generalized to follow instructions in non-English, even though we almost exclusively trained on English. Um, we still don't know why. I wish someone would figure it, this out. Um, um, and it is pretty amazing. Uh, so I thought I'd do a test. So I actually put in, actually the first question here, explain gravity in less than 40 words in a pretty um, um, a language that I don't think there'll be much data in the data set for, which is Macedonian. And it, um, I actually got uh, uh, my friend to try and translate it back into English. And the answer was gravity is the force that attracts objects with mass to each other. So you'll have to take it from me. That, well, in fact, I, I'm, I'm trusting my friend that this is, this, is, uh, this is accurate. So I actually put that back in as a prompt and, uh, and it came back with a response, correct. That is an equivalent definition of gravity in English. So I think that's pretty amazing. Um, and it's, I mean, it's quite astonishing how it can, uh, can do that. So uh, we can, uh, maybe we should ask Lorenzo for his opinion later on why, why it works so well. Um, anyway, so what about training data? So this is, uh, this is really interesting. I read the paper. Um, so the, the, the pre-training model, um, the GPT-3 on which ChatGPT is based, and by the way, it looks to me, uh, people have said, well, what, what is chat GPT where, basically? Is it, is it GPT 3.5 or 4 or whatever? But I mean, having looked at the paper and, and looked at some of the present, listened to presentations and people speaking at OpenAI, I think it is literally just GPT 3 uh, with then instruct GPT put on top. Um, there's no evidence to suggest otherwise when you look into details. Um, so, um, so GPT 3 is the, uh, the base. Uh, language model there, which has 300 billion tokens. So if you remember the table earlier that I had of the large language models, that was the number of, of tokens. Um, um, I should have explained earlier, or maybe Lorenzo did, but tokens are, aren't words, but you can, let's keep it simple and say they are yeah, um, basically equivalent to, to uh, uh, parts of words. Um, and so the, the training, what's interesting is the training data for the uh, reinforcement learning uh, human feedback uh, is only 10, billion to, uh, 10, 10 million tokens. So this is the supervised training is about 20,000 uh, 20, prompts, the reinforcement, um, uh, sorry, the reward modeling, 230,000 prompts and then reinforcement uh, learning only 50,000 prompts. So that's about 200,000. Uh, um, prompts which um, 
which means about, you know, an average of about 50 tokens per prompt. Um, so, um, so that's, you know, it's a, a very small um, uh, data set in comparison with the main language model, but obviously there's a lot of human uh, uh, labor gone into training it. Um, now, where did, we talked about where did the model, uh, the data come for the large language model, but uh, where did the data come for these prompts? Well, you know, what's not talked about a lot, although they're not, not hiding, is the actions there in the paper. The actual prompts actually come from people using the you know, Open API playground that you saw earlier. So essentially, those of you who used uh, GPT-3 in the playground um, uh, have actually been um, providing training data for, for chat GPT. So um, as, as, the, as the saying goes, um, um, if, it's, if it's free, you are the product. Um, so I thought I'd have a bit of fun here and, and, and thought, well, so I'm going to go, go, um, go back and, uh, and, and put into the playground this um, prediction we did before, which says stochastic parrots predict the next word, making them useful for collecting, training, and I asked it for something, so rather than you know, useful for generating plausible uh, text. And um, you, well, you can probably guess what it came up with. I'm not surprised it came up with the uh, electronic data. So, you know, it, it, it really depends as to, um, you know, you, you could imagine that if you could train, you could have, have a model which doesn't, you know, has different objectives and, uh, you know, it might come, say the next word is collecting and then you would get a different outcome. So, <clears throat> so yeah, just remember you are the product. Unless you're playing for, playing for chat GPT plus, I guess. Okay, so moving on to search, um, I should uh, move along. I think we've got, we've got plenty of time left for questions, I hope, if I finish uh, quickly. Um, so going back to the question I asked at the start, will chatbots kill the search star? Um, so, well, I don't know. What, um, I thought it'd be fun to go and ask uh, Steve Jobs. Um, he said, well, how would he do that? He's dead. Well, actually, I thought I'd go and, um, um, go and use character AI, which is a kind of an interesting um, chatbot where you can actually you have um, bots which have essentially different characters. You can train them to act like different, uh, different characters. So this is a character which, which, um, which uh, has been set up to be like Steve Jobs. So I guess I'll read this out again because it's small. So I said, uh, how much will chatbots transform the search engine market and how? And Steve Jobs uh, AI said, to be quite honest, the whole search engine market has completely gone completely off track. People are no longer searching for information, just shopping or looking at pictures, or even worse, in my personal opinion, using voice activated assistance to search. All this is just a lazy way of using the power of the internet in a passive way. To answer your question, the true power in every search engine is in the algorithms that rank various resources. And it is here that chatbots machine learning algorithm can deliver the most value to not just search engines, but to, to all online tools in any industry. And I thought that was pretty damn good. So that's why I'm showing it. Um, so Anyway, so some views on about search now, um, you know, our views on search and, and what we're um, increasingly calling answer engines. So um, Majik really is still a, an, um, a search, a traditional search engine, you know, information, information retrieval uh, system, um, like kind of Google was back in uh, the early 2000s. Um, so we do use some AI, but not, not so much. And, and so, uh, you know, we we certainly have concerns that answer engines. Well, we already had concerns before. You know, um, you know, well before chatbots um, started developing recently, that answer engines are really eroding the web. So, if you look on the right here, you know, this is a um, a search I did in Google's uh, asking search or answer engine. What did I get? I got two ads. Um, no, sorry, I got an ad. I then got a featured snippet, which is a kind of what I would call is a kind of a precursor to. Uh, you know, the kind of things we'll probably get with Bard. Um, I, I don't know when featured snippets first came out. I think they were about six, six years ago, um, but essentially, they've essentially been the kind of things that have been keeping people on Google's page rather than encouraging them to link, uh, click through to hyperlinks, although it does have a hyperlink. And then um, I don't know when they started, but then we also get these sort of um, 
people also ask questions where you also get you know more, more answers so you know google in my view uh, my view, my view for, uh, for several years has already been an answer engine and so um even though they're obviously don't have bard in there and probably will have soon um so and obviously you know people are you know the great you know in a sense google was was a fantastic tool for actually encouraging people to you know uh, to discover navigate and transact on the web and it's um they've gradually been eroded in it and this is, you know, these answer, answer engines or chatbots are, 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 are undoubtedly going to do more of that. Um, so we're kind of resisting resisting that. Um, um, that's not to say that we're not looking at these technologies and we have been doing some work on, on what we can do with them. Um, so um, so um, what do we so what do we think about uh, AI? Well, I think you know what we what we think about AI at um, uh, Magic is is in in terms of search, not about AI, I guess, but in search, it's pretty much the opposite of what um, um, Larry Page actually said back in in, in two thousand. I was so I was I, didn't, uh, I, didn't, I was quite shocked to <laughs> when he actually said this so long ago. So I'll, again, I'll read this out because he said this is quite small. So he said in two thousand. AI would be the ultimate version of Google. So if we had the ultimate search engine, it would understand everything on the web. It would understand, um, uh, you know, exactly what you wanted and it will give you the right thing. And that's obviously AI. You know, you know, be able to answer any question basically because almost everything is on the web, right? So I think there's a lot to disagree with there, um, but anyway, I'll leave it there. Uh, I guess it's you know Gill's view on that hasn't changed. Um, and you know this is this is I think this is um, you know uh, there's also some uh, big issues around um, how it um, is going to distort um, view, um, views views of people on the world and, and and information to get. And so I've kind of done this slide here, which I call. AI series bullshit. So I, I actually run a thread on, on Twitter if you want to follow me on Twitter. Um, so I'll be posting, I think I've done about nine posts so far about, you know, so what uh, um, interesting bullshit that comes out of uh, AI. It's not just chat GPT, by the way, I do it from other things. So, so, um, so I'll, again, I'll have to, I'll just read out snippets of this, but the, I'm not going to read it all in, but the one on the left here is about, as I said, chat GPT passes the, the what I call the young test, because um, it has a, definitely has a shadow because uh, it has opinions but no personal opinions and it, so in this post i asked it to uh, to ask he asked it to write me a thread about a reddit a uh, tweet thread about reddit uh, wrote it a very opinionated thread uh, thread which was uh, somewhat um to some extent positive and, and um, very negative and then i said oh what's your opinion of reddit and it said as an ai language model i do not have personal opinions or feelings so However, I can provide you information. So, so it, it, it'll say it doesn't have opinions, but it gives you an opinions if you uh, ask it a different way. And um, I think, um, you know, again, at a really higher level, and again, this relates to AI, there's another example I gave it where I said, um, um, uh, I asked it basically about um, human rights. And I said, well, right, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has two components, one of which is the International Covenant of Civil uh, political rights and the international covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. And you can probably, you can't see the text, I guess, but you can see the maps there. And, uh, you know, I think I, I, I didn't realize this until about nine months ago, but it's very interesting that the, uh, there's only a few countries that haven't ratified these, uh, uh, signed and ratified these, um, these um, um, uh, commitments, I guess, uh, uh, on human rights. Um, and so China, China's the big country, hasn't ratified one of them, and US. The US hasn't ratified the other one. Um, I think if you can see, those of you can see in the area, Saudi Arabia hasn't even signed either of them, but almost all, all the other countries have, have done so. And so I asked uh, ChatGPT about that, and basically it, it actually was um, a bit modest about the US and actually said the uh, US hadn't, had actually hadn't ratified one when they had, um, but, but basically it got it totally, completely wrong on China and Russia. Um, so, you know, um, you've got to ask, you know, um, what's chat GPT aligned with? Well, surprisingly enough, it's aligned with American values or views. Um, so I guess I'm coming towards the end and uh, you've come in on to, as we mentioned, to the, the, the political end of it, as you've gathered. Um, so, and 
you know, I guess this 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 comes into the um, links in with the um, technical term AI alignment. Um, so some general comments. I mean, it's obvious, I guess, that you know, technology is used for good and bad. AI companies um, um, put, you know, are putting very big efforts into alignment. They, you know, they've got some great people who are, you know, are very well intentioned doing some great work in alignment, but they also pontificate about alignment. So don't be fooled, um, because really this all rests on the values of those who are choosing the data and those who are choosing the objective functions. So. And so, and really, you know, uh, I mean, I've been in technology and software since um, since the eighties. So, you know, and, and so, you know, um, I was doing software before the dot com boom, and you know, I'm seeing the same patterns happening right now as we saw back in two thousand. Um, and so, we may have this discussion about alignment, but it's all going to get over, over. It's going to get overtaken, and now it's more, even more. Well, I don't know. Is it? Um, is more. It's more interesting, you might say, because uh, we now have politics in the mix, and and you know in it, we have an AI AI arms race, and you know who gets to decide? Uh, this is really serious stuff. So um, I guess that's enough um, of the uh, uh, doing, uh, scrolling and so on. If um, I guess I've, I've got here some links, which I guess I'll put these put these links on. We can make the slides available or put these links on here. So I've got some links here through to. To, I mean, there, there's a vast amount of information you can look at on chatbots and this technology. I've, I've put some other interesting ones here. I put some links to the open source projects. Uh, I would encourage people if you want to get involved in in um, in in these projects in, uh, and you're not a coder, uh, open the Open Assistant project would be a great one I think to get involved in because you don't even have to be a coder to get involved in that. Um, so there's a, there's a link there. I've got some stuff here about um, search engines, um, and uh, and then I've got some stuff on uh, alignment. Um, so if you want to read up about AI alignment, which is a kind of a very interesting thing, uh, you know, if you're interested in eth ethics and so on, it goes, you know, gets pretty deep there. And uh, there's, um, I guess, one of the most more interesting uh, podcasts. So there's an interesting chat between. Uh, Blake Lemay Lemoyne, who was the guy who said um, Lambda was sentient and sort of resigned or got kicked out of Google, and Gary Marcus, who was kind of a AI skeptic, if you like, uh, academic. So, so that's so that's it, uh, I think, and that's me done. So I guess we can now move on to questions, and we've got fifteen minutes left. If anybody's left, anybody's still with us, uh, thanks for listening, and uh, yeah.